is live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest in Central Europe. Otherwise, I am Canadian from the west coast of Canada. I'm just here on business and family matters and likely back in Canada pretty quickly here. Um, all right. So uh, today we are looking at the listening section. Specifically, we will be uh, doing some part three and four practice, and I will give you some feedback about how to score well on those sections. I hope everybody is having a great uh, day so far and looking forward to a healthy and productive weekend. Hi, Bisser. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Jai Neil. Nice to see our members in the class. Hi, Devas, Alex, Ramas, Rajpreet, Tony, and Kush. Nice to see many students ready to learn. Uh, while we wait for a few more of your peers, this lesson is presented to you by aehelp.com for academic IELTS success. Please visit us there. And for the general IELTS, check us out at G-I-E-L-T-S help.com. That's general IELTS help.com. Arguably, we offer the most and effective materials for improving your scores at the best price. Today, even a better price, you can use the code R4TYJ to get a 20% discount. And we'll use the website today for some listening practice as well. Uh, Kush, I'm feeling fantastic. Thank you for asking me. All right, uh, so the uh, websites, they look like this. This is the academic one here with the blue background. You can click that big red button to join the premium package. And for the general IELTS, it's the green background and you can click that big red button there. All right, students, so uh, we're going to get right into our listening here in just a moment. Um, if you have questions, you can always send me an email to adrian at aehelp.com. Uh, uh, these classes for live streaming, uh, they are at 13.30 and 15 o'clock Central European time, uh, Wednesday to Saturday. So we'll have two more classes tomorrow on the 13th as well. Um, students, I'm going to play the audio. We're going to get right into uh, listening section three or part three, as it's called now in 2020. Um, so we were, we're going to do part three in just a minute. Uh, before we start, a couple of really important requests. Uh, number one, uh, if it's quiet for you, please turn up the audio on your end. I'm using a headset microphone and a nice Bose speaker, but of course it's not the same as if you're listening directly uh, from the website or with your own equipment. So use a headset, turn up the volume, I max volume on my side. If there's something wrong with the audio, let me know so I can stop it. Should be okay though. And uh, the second really important request is please, students, please, do not write answers in the chat. They can confuse the other viewers. We will go through the answers together uh, at the end. So put your answers into a separate document or write them on a separate piece of paper, uh, not into the chat, okay? All right, so here we go with some listening practice. I'm just gonna hop over to our website here, jump into our uh, My Student account. And in the My Student account, we have lots and lots of goodies, including the IELTS audio CDs. And this is test number four and track number uh, three. So get your uh, listening and thinking caps on in English. And here we go with part three. to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening section three. You will hear a panel discussion on the ethics of zoos. 
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Welcome everyone to this very special evening. Tonight's speakers are two distinguished scholars. Dr. Henry Gergen from the University of Edinburgh is a philosopher and animal rights advocate. Dr. Gloria Mesto from Trinity College Dublin is an animal conservationist. Welcome to you both. The topic of tonight's discussion is the ethics of zoos. Here is the fundamental question. Is it right to house animals in zoos or should they live freely in nature instead? As an animal rights advocate and theorist, I have clear views on this question. To me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons and should be afforded many of the rights that human beings have. Chief among these is the right to liberty and the freedom to achieve one's desired aims in life. Clearly, these rights are abrogated by imprisonment within the zoo. Moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely and are subject to confinement in extremely small spaces. While regulation of zoos may help mitigate some of these problems, I maintain that zoos are fundamentally unethical. I certainly understand Dr. Gergen's position, and I do agree on some of his points, most notably that zoos must be held to higher standards of animal treatment than they are currently. But my colleague fails to consider an important point in favor of zoos. The conservation of species is an incredibly important endeavor, and zoos are on the front line in the battle to save hundreds of species of animals around the world. Zoos often employ some of the leading experts in the field who are best equipped to carry out this important task. It is for this reason that I believe zoos are justified. Though they may not be perfect, I believe zoos and the experts they employ play a critical role in the conservation of species and therefore are ethically permissible. Dr. Gergen, do you have a rebuttal to that point? Yes, certainly. While I appreciated Dr. Mester's position as a conservationist, and I do appreciate the work she and others like her do for animal welfare around the world, I must disagree with her. While zoos certainly do play a role in animal conservation, it is not because they are zoos that they play this role. Dr. Gergen, can you clarify that point for the audience? Of course. What I mean is this. It is not inherent in the idea of a zoo that they conserve animals. The notions are separable. You can have an animal conservation effort that is not a zoo, just as you can have a zoo that has nothing to do with conservation. So while it is true that some zoos act as animal preserves, this does not justify the existence of zoos, since we could easily separate out these animal preserves from zoos themselves. Fair point, but such animal preserves would still have the associated problems of poor treatment and unsuitable living conditions. Yes but at least it would be in an effort towards a positive end. The animals would not be captive forever, and they would not be captive merely for a human audience. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the interview and answer questions 27 to 30. What about the enjoyment and education that zoos provide, especially to young people? Perhaps individuals like yourselves were inspired to become animal advocates by attending a zoo when you were a child. That is a really interesting point. I was indeed inspired by going to a zoo when I was a child. What do you think, Dr. Gergen? It is an interesting thought. What if the positive outcomes caused by inspiring people like us to do good in the future outweigh the harms done to zoo animals? I'm not sure I would have to think about it more, but it's certainly an interesting question. Well, thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. In closing, I'm not sure how much progress we've made, but is it safe to say that we can all agree that zoos, at the very least, 
must do their best to improve the treatment of animals and the conditions in which the animals live. I would certainly agree with that, as I'm sure my friends would also agree. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. And students, use that half minute to check your answers. Make sure you didn't make any spelling mistakes or some uh, mistakes reading the question, for example. Those are some easy catches at this point. We'll go through uh, these um, answers together now. Uh, and uh, before we get into it, um, a just a quick question. What do you think were the accents that you heard in this audio? So what were the accents for these speakers? All three of them are native English speakers. And hint, all three of them have different accents. Uh, can anybody guess what accents they heard here? So this is just a question before we look at the question. So what were the accents in the audio here? What do you think? So somebody says Australian Temercon. Nope, there was no Australian Temercon, but you're close. Alex, definitely no Irish. Uh, Sarav Deep, one of them was British, the host. Yeah, the host was British. And I'm still waiting for the other two. You haven't guessed it. There was no Australian. Okay. Uh, no Scottish, no Irish. Billy, very good. Billy's like, was that a New Zealand accent? It was. Okay. So it was a New Zealand, also called a Kiwi accent. So New Zealand, yeah. Also known as the Kiwi accent. That was Dr. Gergen. And the other doctor was a Canadian. Okay. So the male professor was a New Zealand accent. The female professor was a Canadian. So here you heard a British, a Kiwi, and a Canadian accent. Uh, students, be ready for these kinds of variations in accents in the IELTS. So keep in mind that although the IELTS is mostly in the British accent and English, you can hear other accents in the listening. Uh, also, this is just a little bit of a side note, you may have a speaking interview with a non-British accent. Okay, so yes, definitely um, focus on uh, the um, British accent for the most part. So be very familiar with the British accent, but definitely listen to a bit of Canadian, American. Those are the easier to understand. Also some Kiwi, also some Australian. You probably won't hear any heavy Irish or heavy uh, Scottish accents, those can be very difficult, so I think they kind of stay away from that. But you can definitely hear Australian, Canadian, New Zealand accents as well, okay? So be really, really careful. So here you heard three of them, okay? The New Zealand one is probably a little bit trickier. All right, um, let's get into some uh, answers here. So uh, we had to match the professor with their university. Uh, we had Dr. Henry Gergen, who was the man, and we had uh, Dr. Gloria Mesto. Um, where was Dr. Henry Gergen from? So uh, which one is the answer for number one? Is it A or is it B? Here you kind of had a 50-50. So you're saying number one is A, and that means number two is B. I think many of you said that. That was kind of uh, the easier one there, and indeed one was A and two was B. So uh, in spaces... Uh, for 21, okay, notice that this is one question, so you had to do it like this, okay, in your answer sheet, this is the paper-based exam, you'd have to do it like this, number one, A, number two, B. that's how you should put it, so it's really, really clear. If you put A, B, you'll get it right because that order is correct, okay, but just to be on the safe side, do it like that, okay, if you write B, A, you'll get it wrong, 
All right, so careful, careful. And that's for question 21. Don't accidentally put those in spaces one and two on your answer sheet, okay? Not to be confused. All right, um, so now questions 22 to 24. So here you had three questions, okay? These go into three spaces in the answer sheet in any order. And here you had to listen for what are the three arguments given against zoos. And that was mostly by Dr. Gergen with the New Zealand accent. So you had animals are treated inhumanely. Animals are persons. The conservation of species. Animals should not be in prison. Animals are human beings and should be treated equally. They are fundamentally wrong. What were the correct answers here? And if you got the answers A, B, and F, then you got them correctly. So what this person says is animals are treated inhumanely. Animals are persons, okay? And they are fundamentally wrong. Uh, he does not talk about conservation of species. That doesn't make sense because it's a positive. Let me give you a couple of strategies. I think that was probably quite challenging uh, for some students. So I'll give you a couple of strategies for these multi-multiple choice, okay? Uh, it's really difficult to listen and pick out the answers for these while you listen. Okay, that's my first tip here. So uh, what I call these, and others as well, is the multi, uh, multiple choice questions. Okay, where you have to choose, uh, choose three or more from seven or eight choices. Okay, so this one really gets students and many students lose one or two marks on this. So here are a couple of tips, okay? Tip, uh, it's very difficult to catch these uh, while looking at the choices. So instead, take notes of what you hear and use logic okay so uh, if you listen carefully here you could actually hear the person say animals are persons and we can see this uh, in the transcripts I'll show you that so that's at the uh, back of the book it's on page 115 in this case and let me uh, let me get to this here so uh, here you see the script and this is what uh, Dr. Henry Gergen is actually saying. So Dr. Henry Gergen says, I have clear views on this question. Uh, to me, it is fundamentally wrong to lock up animals for human enjoyment. So here on your question sheet, you should write something like fundamentally wrong. I wouldn't even write the word wrong. I would just write an X, X meaning wrong. Okay, learn these quick ways to take notes. So fundamentally wrong. Okay, I would write that down. Okay, and then uh, he continues by, I believe that in many important respects, animals are persons. So animal person. Okay, you can write down that note really quickly. Okay, because you can hear that he's talking against zoos. All right. Um, and then here he says a little bit later on, moreover, in many cases, animals in zoos are treated inhumanely, inhumanely, okay? So if you're listening and you're quick and you're thinking quickly, uh, you'll get these notes. Now, let me go back to the questions here and you'll see what I mean uh, by logic as well, okay? So this is what you want to do because even as a as a native speaker who's teaching IELTS, sometimes i find these questions a little bit challenging okay to get it in real time just staring at these choices so here we have them again so if this were my question sheet in this case i suppose it is uh, i would have these three notes and now i can match these up later 
Okay, so remember that you have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. You can answer these later, right? So uh, you can go, okay, all right, so I see the inhumanely, I see the persons, and I see the fundamentally wrong. Okay, so that's the notes part. Um, the other part of it, the logic part, is conservation of species. It's not something that zoos usually do, so that's logically wrong. Okay, that's a logical mistake, so you shouldn't be choosing that. As long as you understand the words, you shouldn't be choosing that. Now, students, this is part three, so uh, don't expect to just match words that you hear, keywords. It doesn't work like that for part three and part four. You have to understand most of what you're listening and most of the questions to get them correct. Otherwise, it's just a game of luck. There is no keyword matching in part three and part four. Okay, so you have to at least somewhat understand it. Okay, uh, animals should not be in prison. Um, that it, it makes sense, but you don't hear the word prison, right? So that's where your notes come in helpful. Um, animals are human beings and should be treated equally. Uh, animals are not human beings, so again, that's another logical. So you can actually get uh, two of the questions out of the seven, and now it's just down to five. So logic helps you to eliminate two questions, okay? And since the order doesn't matter, you'll at least get a couple of them right, okay? Uh, for these types of questions, the paper-based exam is definitely a little bit easier than the computer-based exam because in the computer-based exam, you are choosing in real time, and it's definitely a little bit trickier to get these correct, in my opinion. Okay, So for this one, paper-based has a little bit of an advantage, in, in my opinion. Okay. All right, um, so again, the correct answers were A, B, and F. Okay, so remember those tips, all right? Okay, uh, let's keep going here. So this question, it was 25 to 27. You had to fill in the blanks with no more than two words and or a number. Um, and here, it was interesting because it actually, this question was broken into the two parts of the listening. And in some cases, that can happen. So uh, number 25, in order to improve conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to something of animal treatment. So what was the answer here? So in order to improve conditions, the conditions for zoo animals, zoos must be held to what? Sarav Deep says higher standard. Um, yeah, and here, because you don't see the article a or an, um, it has to be plural, okay? So it's higher standards, okay? So here you have an adjective, here you have a noun, here you have no article, a uh, or un, okay? So that makes it clear that this is a plural, okay? S, so remember that. Uh, especially when you're transferring your answers to the answer sheet or when you're uh, looking for that 30 seconds to review your answers, uh, look for the articles when your answers include nouns, okay? So that's just another quick tip here to maybe save some marks, okay? So uh, for short answers and fill in the blanks, Make sure to look for articles, a, uh, an, uh, a, uh, an. Uh, if you don't see them, and the answer is a noun, it will be a plural, okay? If you do see it, obviously, the opposite, the answer is singular. Okay, so you can easily catch a couple of marks that way. So be really, really careful, okay, for those. All right, makes sense, hopefully. 
All right, um, let's keep rolling. So here we go with a little bit more. Uh, giving answers to the next questions for these fill in the blanks. So here, uh, again, we had higher standards, higher standards. Okay. And then number 26, while zoos do conserve animal life, Dr. Gergen argues that this function could also be performed by animal something. What was the answer there? Animal what? Nobody has it so far. Um, what is it? Nope, it's not animal conversation, Alex. Con sorry, conservation. It's not animal conservation. Um, these uh, kind of special places where it's natural, it's uh, using fences to stop people and uh, maybe predators from attacking the animals. Uh, what are those called? Neurogen wall that's close. It's close, not quite the right word. Billy, very good. It's preserves, preserves, Billy, preserves. Okay, uh, know this collocation. Animal preserves are pieces or areas of land that are protected uh, for animals to live freely. Uh, think about the elephant preserves in Africa, okay? So in Africa, you have these nice large elephant preserves where the elephants are protected from uh, human poachers especially okay hunters um, and even by armed military all right they're called preserves i think you have these in india as well for bengal tigers uh, you have animal preserves where the bengal tigers live in a protected area that's guarded um, from poachers and so on if i'm not mistaken all right so um yeah, preserves. Again, no article, plural, preserves, right? Okay. Yeah, national parks are considered preserves, Alex. That's right. Okay, uh, next one, 27, enjoyment and something are two key positive attributes of zoos. This one, you can probably even guess, even if you didn't hear it, uh, just thinking logically. So when you go to a zoo, you have fun looking at the animals, the monkeys, the wolves, the parrots, the eagles, and you also read about them and learn about them, right? So clearly it's education. Okay. Uh, if you miss a question, just think logically, right? Again, what do I do when I go to a zoo? I enjoy myself with people, with the company, family maybe that I'm there with. And also I learn about animals and their habitats and what they do, their behaviors while looking at them. So education is the clear answer there. Okay, so far so good everyone. Now uh, let's keep going here with part three. Few more questions. Uh, here we had some multiple choice. Again, for multiple choice, think about the answer. Uh, don't just stare at the options, okay? That's a very big problem that many students uh, make is that big mistake that they make is they stare at the answers hoping that the answer is going to just kind of whoa, pop out and hit them in the face and say, oh, I'm the right answer, look at me. Um, no, that doesn't always happen. So uh, just a quick tip with multiple choice. I frequently get questions from students of, can you give me some tips for multiple choice questions? So MCQ in the uh, listening section. Um, here you go. Firstly, do not hope that the answer will uh, jump out at you from the choices. Okay. That's what a lot of students do, and that's not an effective strategy. So instead, uh, listen, uh, so change uh, the questions to statements and listen for the answer. Often they are paraphrased, especially for part three and four. Often they are paraphrased. So listen for the closest match. Okay, that's the trick, all right? 
That's what you want to do. So here, the question is, according to Dr. Gergen, does the value of inspiring young people outweigh the negative aspects of Zeus? So I changed this into a statement. So uh, Dr. Gergen says that he is not sure whether or not the uh, zoos inspire young people. It's more important than the negative aspects, or he thinks that it is, or he thinks that it's not. So I kind of change it to these options as I'm reviewing this, okay? And then I'm listening for that. Now in this one, you would actually get kind of lucky because he says, I'm not sure. So again, there's a little bit of paraphrasing because he is unsure, is not exactly the same as I'm not sure, but he says, I'm not sure. I'd have to check that, okay? So the answer here was C. Good Kush, good be back. Yeah, you got it right, it's C. Um, again, the strategy here is listen for the answer, then look for the choice. Listen for the answer, then look for the choice. Don't look for the choice and hope to get the answer. Very important, okay? So listen for the answer, look for the choice. Don't hope for the opposite. Doesn't work. All right. Um, next couple. 29, what is the interesting question? Okay, so what is the interesting question? Um, zoos are, whether or not zoos are ethical, whether the inspiration value of zoos outweighs their negative aspects, or whether enjoyment and inspiration negate the importance of zoos, A, B, or C. Here the answer was B. So Dr. Gergen says, well, I'd have to think about that more. That's an interesting question. Um, now, when you see these colons like this here, it means you're going to hear exactly those words. And you have to listen exactly for those words. So uh, these quotation marks means that it's a direct quote, okay? Quotation marks are used for direct quotes, okay? So when you hear, see the direct quote, that means you're going to hear exactly these words. So you have to carefully listen for those words in direct quotes, okay? Don't miss that. And then you'll hear, him, hear the man say, uh, well, that's an interesting question, whether their inspirational value outweighs um, their negative impact. Okay. And then uh, last one here, question 30. Uh, what do the guests agree on? So what do the guests agree on? Last one, zoo conditions need to be improved. Zoos are unethical. The inspiration value of zoos is unethical. Okay, very last one, number 30. Abdijibar says A. Glavidator says A. Sammy, our member, agrees that it's A, and you are correct. So they both agree that uh, zoo conditions can always be better. Uh, so A is the right answer there. And hopefully you did quite well. All right. Um, so that's just a lot of tips. Now, probably you also realize something interesting that here, the second half of part three was quite fast. And um, you actually kind of uh, heard the answer for 28, 29, and 30, and even 27 quite quickly. Uh, that happens for part three and part four especially, okay? So keep that important tip in mind, and I'm going to write that up before we listen to part four, okay? So tip, here's a tip, uh, especially in part three and four of the uh, listening section. Some answers come quite slowly, while others come quite quickly. So, stay sharp, okay? You can't uh, kind of wander off or think about other ideas. You really have to stay sharp because sometimes the answers are like, answer, answer answer and then suddenly it's like answer so sometimes they come really fast sometimes they come really slow they're not 
It's not like paced. It's not like some students think, oh, there's an answer coming every 20 seconds. No, okay? It's not like that. Sometimes you have two, three answers coming within 10 seconds, and then you don't have the next answer coming for another 25, 30 seconds. So uh, be careful, all right? Be careful. And that's especially true for part three and four. In part one, the answers are quite evenly spaced because it's measuring lower level and it would be really difficult at the lower level of English to catch all the quick answers. So part one, part two, the spacing, the timing of the answers, it's a little bit more incremental, but not for part three and four. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's get into uh, part four. So again, for part four, I'm going to play the audio. Please put your answers onto a separate piece of paper or in a separate sheet. We're going to get right into part four, and then we'll go through the answers together after students. So uh, here's part four coming up. Um, get ready for it. No break in part four. It's seamless. It's continuous. Okay, I'm just going to hop back over to our website here and start the audio. Uh, again, if you have trouble hearing the audio, just uh, turn up the volume, use a headset. All right, here we go. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a professor discussing the migration of loggerhead turtles. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. It's late April on the South Atlantic coast of North America, and one of the most remarkable journeys in all of nature is about to begin. The loggerhead turtle, whose natural habitat is the open ocean, has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of Florida provide a perfect nesting spot, with soft sand that can be dug up by the persistent flippers of the female loggerhead. Over the course of the next three months, hundreds of thousands of eggs will be laid on such beaches. Many of these eggs will become the victim of predators, but many will survive to hatching, which occurs two months after being laid. Hatching marks the beginning of an incredible journey for the loggerhead turtle. Almost immediately upon hatching, the young turtles, known as hatchlings at this point, head for the open ocean. The ocean, while full of its own dangers and predators, provides a relative safe haven for the hatchlings away from many of the predators that live near the shoreline. These young turtles embark upon a journey that will take them upwards of 13,000 kilometres around the North Atlantic. Many animals make large and incredible journeys, but what makes the loggerhead turtle's migration so notable is the speed at which the animal moves. While many bird species make similar journeys, they move at velocities much faster than the loggerhead turtle. This slow-moving beast travels at the remarkably sluggish pace of only three quarters of a kilometre per hour. This means it will take the turtle a minimum of 17,000 hours to complete its migratory journey not even taking into account stops for feeding and sleep. To put that number in perspective, 17,000 hours is approximately two years of non-stop swimming. That the loggerhead turtle makes this journey alone makes it all the more impressive. From birth to adolescence to adulthood, the loggerhead turtle is a solitary traveller. But how does it know where to go? Doesn't it need a parent to help it know the route? This is where the loggerhead becomes even more fascinating. Recent research tells us the loggerhead uses the magnetic field of the Earth to determine its migration route. Because the Earth's magnetic field differs in each location around the world, the loggerhead turtle can use it as a kind of innate roadmap, illuminating the way to where they need to be. One example of this is the behaviour they exhibit when they encounter the particular magnetic field off the coast of Portugal. Instead of continuing north waters of northern Europe, they sense the magnetic field and turn around. 
instead heading for the warmer waters of northwestern Africa. And it is not just that the loggerhead turtle has a sort of innate compass. They are able to determine, with surprising precision, their latitude and longitude. They know exactly when to zig and zag to optimise their migratory pattern. Even with their incredible ability to know where they are and where they need to be, the survival rate of migratory loggerhead turtles is incredibly low. In fact, only about one in 4,000 hatchlings makes it back to the beach in eastern Florida to mate and lay its eggs. However, that any make it at all is an incredible achievement and one of the great natural wonders of navigation. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. All right, students, and again, check your answers. Now, I see a couple of students thought that was a little bit fast, but that's still natural, normal English, okay? And this is a professor giving a lecture in a class. So uh, in your university and college classes, for those of you who will be studying in English, be ready because sometimes professors speak this fast or even faster. They have a lot of material to cover. They want to get through it all in the class and they'll give presentations that are just as fast as this, sometimes even faster. So you have to be able to catch it. Also, uh, in schools, in uh, universities, colleges in Canada, US, Australia, UK, uh, not all of the information on your exams is found on the internet or in your textbooks. Some of it is coming directly from the lecture. So if you're not catching the information and taking down notes, you'll lose marks on your exam. So be ready for this kind of faster paced English, yet still natural English. All right, let's go through these answers uh, together. Okay, together. So uh, here we go, the loggerhead turtle. So we have the picture of the turtle here has to seek dry land to lay its eggs. The sandy beaches of something provide the perfect location for nesting. Uh, Niraj Narwal says that word is Florida. Omar Ashraf and Savardeep agree. And it is, it's Florida, uh, capital F. It's the name of an American state. Uh, Florida, beautiful state, home to Disney World and Universal Studios. Um, so, absolutely Florida. All right. Now, sometimes people say that, oh, part four was actually easier for me than part three. That can be true sometimes because part four is often a monologue. It's one person talking and part three is two or three people talking. So part four can seem a little bit easier at times, but be careful. It might not be. All right. After hatching, the loggerhead turtle immediately heads for the ocean. The ocean is, a, is safer than the shore because it has fewer something. So fewer what? Yeah, Amanjat, Savardeep, Shirojidin, Jaha. Very good. Uh, all lowercase here. So it's predators, right? Um, and it's plural and it's uh, small p. Okay, again, learn your common nouns versus your uh, proper nouns. The turtles embark on a journey that will take them something kilometers around the Atlantic. Uh, how many kilometers are these turtles swimming across the Atlantic? What's going on here? How far do these amazing creatures swim? Jaws says 13,000. Our member Samuel and Sammy agree, and you're right, it is 13,000. So it's 13,000 kilometers, okay? Now the fastest way to write 13,000 is 13K, but because of the kilometers, I would write the zeros, okay? So make sure to write the zeros. If you have a comma, that's okay as well, right? So 13,000, yeah. Uh, don't use the word Niraj Narwal because it's not 13,000s, it's just 13,000. If you write 13,000s like this, uh, you'll get that wrong because there is no S when we have it as a noun. So adjective, noun, no plural. Okay, so it's 13,000, not thousands. 
So careful, easier to do this. You don't make that mistake. You'll get it correct. All right, uh, let's keep rolling along here. So while long migratory journeys are fairly commonplace in nature, what makes the loggerhead's journey especially notable is the extremely something pace it travels at. Samuel says that's sluggish. Yeah, Amanjot, it's a turtle. It's not, can't be fast, Amanjot Kaur. It's got to be sluggish. Okay, um, so very slow. Sluggish. Okay, uh, in English, that's a snail. Okay, like in SpongeBob SquarePants, Gary is a snail. Uh, when the snail has no house, oh, it's, no, where'd my house go? It's called a slug. Okay, snail with a house, no house, slug. Slug used as a verb to mean very slow, sluggish, sluggish. Okay, sluggish means slow, used as an adjective here, or sorry, as an ad, uh, yeah, adjective, sluggish pace, yeah. Okay, so snail has a house, no house, slug, sluggish. All right, uh, the entire journey is equal to approximately something of continuous swimming with no breaks. Number 35, yeah, it's two years. Easiest way to write that? Learn abbreviations, save yourself time, especially with the fast audio in part four. If you have fast audio, use an abbreviation for things like years, kilometers, and so on. Okay, use symbols. So don't write the word years out, just two years, just like that. Okay, they'll take that answer. Okay, uh, let's keep going here. Uh, we had a little bit more fill in the blanks. As incredible as the loggerhead turtle's journey is, what makes it even more impressive is that the loggerhead is a something traveler. Okay, adjective coming in here. Samuel, very good. Tamir Khan, very good. Solitary. Means it travels alone. Okay, so solitary, or another way that you could write it, which is acceptable, alone is not good, alone won't work in here, but you could write solo, okay? Solo traveler, solitary. If any of you saw the uh, series Star Wars, one of very, very famous character in Star Wars is Han Solo. It's kind of a funny uh, use of the word solo because Han Solo, that character, usually flies around with just Chewbacca. He likes to be alone. He doesn't like others bothering him, so he's Han Solo. Uh, okay, so he's a solitary traveler. All right, uh, traversing the open ocean on its own for years at a time. Scientific research has in recent years told us that it is through a connection with the Earth's something that the turtles find their way around the ocean. Very good, Samuel, Tamir Khan, Rashid, very good. Jaha, nicely done, Savar Deep. Yeah, magnetic field. Magnetic field. So the Earth's magnetic field. Absolutely, nicely done. Okay, um, for example, the turtles are able to sense something off the coast of, so here it's definitely a location. Coast is like the beach or the shoreline. Uh, so what's the answer for number 38? Something off the coast of, laugh out loud shotgun. You can find speaking partners on our website, ahelp.com for free. Uh, Bebec, yeah, Portugal. Very good, Bebec. Portugal. Okay. Portugal, Omar, Ashraf, nice. Yeah, they sent something off the port coast of Portugal and then they changed directions. Uh, awesome. Uh, so now a little bit more, two more questions left. Uh, possessing more than a simple compass, the loggerhead can innately sense it's something and longitude. So uh, here, uh, longitude is like this. 
Okay, this is the earth. And uh, we, of course, have these lines as well. In the center, we have the equator. In the north, we have Tropic of Capricorn. In the south, we have Tropic of Cancer. Um, and uh, we have all these other lines. The equator, the Tropic of Capricorn, Tropic of Cancer are called your lines of latitude. Very good for all of those who got that. So latitude, latitude. I'm sure many of you who study sciences have learned these words in English. Um, students, knowing the words latitude and longitude, if you're lost, can be really helpful, especially if you're an adventure enthusiast, if you like skiing, uh, sailboating, these kinds of adventure sports, hiking in the forest. Uh, know these words, latitude, longitude, because if somebody is trying to help you, they don't speak your language, they might use these words to identify location or coordinates. Okay, so latitude, longitude. All right. Um, last one. Inference type, multiple choice question. Number 40, approximately what percentage of hatchlings make it back to the breeding ground in Florida? So how many of these amazing creatures, these turtles, make it back uh, 0 0.025, 2.5, or 25%. Uh, correct answer is A. It's sad but true. Um, the speaker says one in 4,000 make it back to the beach. Uh, one in 4,000 is equal to 0.025%. Okay. Uh, just keep in mind that at least probably a couple thousand of them have an amazing adventure. Okay, so, and some of them come back to complete that adventure. What an amazing natural selection process that is for this species of turtle. Okay, so one in 4,000, Amanjot. That's why it's that one. All right, um, so students, uh, count up your answers. Uh, if you were here in yesterday's class, you can now add the two classes together and you can get your total out of 40, what did you get? Um, and I'll show you something cool here. If you go to our websites, you can actually change your raw score into um, your band score. I'll show you that on the website. I just darkened the screen so you can see the website. Okay, so there you can see we have all of our goodies, computer-based exams, lesson videos. And then at the bottom, you have this uh, score calculator. There it is, score calculator. So if you open up that page, you'll have um, this uh, function for listening and academic reading, okay? And uh, there you can type in, I think the first one is the listening, yeah? So you can type in your raw score. And um, Niran Jarwal says 34 out of 40, so 34 is uh, 7.5, okay. Uh, Jai Neal, uh, 27 is uh, 6.5, okay, not bad. All right, Billy, 35 um, is uh, band 8, so 34, 75, 35, band 8, okay. Uh, Shirojidin, 33 is 7.5, all right, so you can check that out there. Uh, 1B10, 1B10 says 23. A score of 23 is a band 6. Okay, band 6, 1B10. Thank you for that. All right, Bisser, 25. Yeah, I think that's going to be band 6 as well. Yeah, there it is. So you can check that out. Um, for the reading, make sure if you're doing academic reading, use the academic website, aehelp.com, because it's a different system than general IELTS. If you're doing general IELTS reading, please use gieltshelp.com because they're scored differently. This is the same, but that's scored differently, okay? And I see we have a new member that just joined as well. Send me an email so I can hook you up with all of those goodies as well. Okay, uh, so uh, if you want to join our websites uh, today, again, you can get a 20% discount um, to get all of our practice exams, six of them, over 100 hours of videos, interactive courses, and uh, that you can do uh, when you go to ahelp.com or gieltshelp.com, use the code R4TYJ on the purchase form, okay? So look for our logos, make sure you're on the right site. 
Uh, that's it for today. I'll be back tomorrow with some speaking practice for part two and part three. Matha one, thank you for joining our members. Uh, send me uh, an email and I'll hook you up with those videos, the requests and the exams. All right, everyone. Have a fantastic rest of your day. Have a great start to your weekend. I'll see you all tomorrow, hopefully, for some speaking practice and strategy. My name is Adrian. Much love to all of you. I'm signing out from Budapest. Bye for now, everyone.